Hello, my fabulous World Geography students. I appreciate you guys being here with me today. Um, today's topic is environment and society in North America. Here are today objectives for today. Um, we're going to look at people's activities, the way that we interact and alter the environment, um, especially where it concerns water systems. Um, look at the model forest program and look at some policy decisions that have been implemented to help us protect the environment. And this is a big subject in the news today. So hopefully you guys are catching 10 to 15 minutes of the news and uh, we'll be even more up to date about what's going on with our policies in North America. We've got two vocabulary words today, aquifers. Aquifers are underground water sources, overfishing, Overfishing is exactly what it sounds like. Removing fish from an area at a rate faster than they can reproduce. So we're catching more fish than they can have baby fish, right? And aquifers are underground water sources. Alteration of the environment, farmland and forest. So if we look at the map on the left, it's a map that shows us the different native or indigenous tribes um, here all across North America. Um, you can see down in Georgia, we've got a uh, little Cherokee, Chickasaw Creek down closer to where I live in Columbus um, and what the dominant economic activity is. So if we look at kind of this uh, purpley color here, it's agriculture. And that kind of makes sense being here in Georgia um, throughout uh, the what we call like the Midwest up through all the way through northern Canada and up at the very point of Greenland here where the Inuit people make up a good portion of Greenland's um, population there it was hunting um, out west we have in this reddish kind of color uh, hunting and gathering and then up the Pacific Northwest all the way into Alaska and then around the Gulf of Mexico to Florida um, down in the Caribbean, fishing, which also makes a lot of sense. But that's the economic, economic activity in pre-Columbus North America. A lot of times you'll see that referred to as pre-Columbian, the pre-Columbian era. And all that refers to is the time before Christopher Columbus came to the New World. On the right, we see economic activity in modern North America. So if you kind of take a look at, you know, how... Um, these two are related. You can see that um, commercial fishing, which is kind of a light blue color, you know, it's still active around Alaska, which is, you know, interesting because hundreds of years ago, that was the main thing as well. Um, but now we also have um, forestry, livestock raising, some commercial fishing, um, a little subsistence farming, but um, forestry is a big, a big one now. Um, actually cutting down the trees. We talked a lot about that in the lesson before in Unit 7, Lesson 1, um, about deforestation and the impact. So take a look at both of those maps and compare kind of what was before and what is current today um, in the United States and Canada. All right, guys, so what are some technological advances that have made it possible for people to live in formerly uninhabited places? So you might be thinking to yourself, well, houses, right? I mean, and that, that is a big, a big one. What is something that we can't live with or we, I guess, could? I would find it really difficult to live without my air conditioning, right? Even to live without my heat in the winter, even though it doesn't get very cold in Georgia, um, it could be uncomfortably cold. Um, so, you know, indoor heating and air is a huge advancement. Um, something that is really very recent in our society. Um, when we think about people that live in um, Upper Canada, Alaska, um, you know, definitely the insulation and the dwellings. Um, so there are a lot of those. So just think to yourself, what might be some technological advances that have made it possible for us to live where before it would not have been a possibility? Uh, transportation systems. Um, they have really helped us to easily travel to places such as mountaintop communities, um, tunnels and bridges, uh, more modern agricultural practices allow us to irrigate the desert, 
Um, and remember when we said irrigate, that means basically to bring water to, right? Um, because without water, we can't have life. And you can look and see at the picture of the guy at the bottom there um, running an irrigation tube where they're growing food in what looks like an extremely dry kind of desert region. Um, but all these technological advances, you know, to cross over a mountain um, 150 years ago would have taken, you know, a, a lot of time um, before they were blowing up through mountains to create passes or underground tunnels through the mountains, whatever it might be, if you had to go over a mountain as opposed to through it, it took a lot more time and could be a lot more dangerous to do so. Um, when we think about islands, if you've ever been over to the coast of Georgia, um, you might have had to take a bridge to go one of the islands. Um, before that, you would have had to like go on a little boat out. So a lot of things that we've seen in the past couple hundred of years and technological advances have, have drastically changed our world and the way that we relate to each other and that we can reach each other. It has not been without cost though, right? Um, logging has depleted the forest. Um, grasslands have been converted to farms causing soil erosion. Um, you know, irresponsible logging can cause soil erosion too because the roots of the trees aren't there to hold the soil in. And we've talked about that before, how that can cause landslides on the mountainsides. Um, the diversion and damming of rivers has reduced the natural habitats, threatening the existence of many plant and animal species. All right, so if we look at this tracking change, the Great Plains, um, what this was known as the bread basket. And that's exactly what it talked about. And we talked about that a little bit when we spoke about Europe. There's that Northern European plain, which said the European bread basket. And so in the United States, we have something very similar right in the Midwest, the bread basket area. Um, but there were some really just poor farming practices is what it says. So, um, and, and poor meaning like not well done, um, poorly done. So drought in the 1930s um, causes this severe soil erosion between the farming practices, the lack of water, and it became what was known as the Dust Bowl. Um, and you'll learn more about that in U.S. history. So tuck that one away in your brain as, as one of those items that you've got to know. Um, more industrialization came about, more pesticides. We talked about that in Lesson 1 as well. Um, and fertilizers, um, you know, putting those chemicals on the, the plants, on the crops, the, them going into the soil, um, it can cause some issues and just generally more pollution. Um, so in what we call today the breadbasket, um, think of like fields of wheat, corn, those kind of things. But in the 30s went through a really severe issue. Um, we talked also yesterday uh, in lesson one about biodiversity threats. So um, a big one is climate change, and that is constantly in the news. Um, the planet is gradually and gradually getting warmer. Um, logging is a definite issue um, in North America. Without responsible deforestation and replanting, um, you know, we continue to, to cause more and more issues. Um, our population growth in the last 200 years, we looked at that clock. Um, for both the United States and the world, and both of them are just ticking up. The United States much more slowly than the world population, but still it is growing. Um, the introduction of non-native species can really, um, especially for you guys who've, who've studied like biomes, can really be an issue when you have non-native species introduced um, and can cause everything to get out of balance. And, and Mother Nature likes to be in balance, right? Um, Overgrazing you know, can cause a lot of detriment to our environment when animals um, are allowed to roam and over, basically overeat is what overgrazing is on the land that they have been provided. Um, wildfires, and that's what we've seen in Australia, just a huge, huge blow to both um, the animal life, the ecology there. And again, we've talked about it in class, but who knows exactly what the, the long-term effects of those wildfires are going to be. And that's a danger in the United States too. We hear a lot of times about wildfires in California, for instance. 
and then overall pollution like what um, is going into our air into the soil and into the um, waterways alteration of the environment freshwater um, and freshwater is distributed unevenly um, it's not like the planet was formed and it was like okay everybody's going to get an equal share right some places have more fresh water than others um, and and some crops need a lot more water than other crops um, for instance like cotton very water intensive um, and that's concerning when they're planted in areas where there's not a lot of fresh water and they're trying to support those type of crops dry areas like texas and new mexico it's really a concern um, water pollution is a is a concern because we've talked again about you know depending on what type of pesticide or herbicide you may be using you may be just putting toxic chemicals directly into the soil um, and then when you start talking about big industrial farms, not just like a small farmer, but big industrial farms, you're talking about massive amounts of those chemicals that may go into the soil and then those get washed away into our waterways. Um, also untreated wastewater um, can come cause like some severe health hazards. And that definitely makes sense, right? If uh, bad water is leaking out of the pipes in our city and going into uh, waterways, it can definitely uh, nobody wants untreated wastewater, a.k.a. sewage. All right, so alteration of the environment, marine. Technological advances in the fishing industry have led to overfishing. As a result, the supply of fish has been depleted in a number of areas. For example, um, in the North Atlantic Ocean, a highly profitable fishing area, populations of cod, haddock, redfish, and several species of flatfish are greatly reduced. Um, in the Pacific, the supply of salmon is in danger. In the Columbia River Basin, the salmon population has declined as much as 80%. And that is a huge portion of a, of a population of a species. Um, if we look at the pictures here, there are more and bigger fishing vessels than ever before. Um, the biggest vessels catch 65% of all the fish, but they only employ 4% of the fishermen. Um, so that's a big big different you know huge boats not a lot of people to man those um and they're catching massive amounts have you ever watched one of those shows like the the um was the biggest catch or whatever you know that comes on uh, a channel and you can see you know they don't have a lot of people that are working on the ships but they're pulling in lots and lots of fish and there's less and less fish in the sea um when we look at the environment um alteration of the environment marine. So we need to be careful of runoff from agriculture and other industry um, producing harmful microorganisms into the marine system. Um, as a result, fish and shellfish have been killed. The North Carolina coast, the Chesapeake Bay and lagoons and estuaries off the Gulf of Mexico are frequent victims of such runoff. And you can see some examples here. Arsenic, which is um, a poison to us, found in 10% of marine catfish. 2% of Atlantic croaker and 2% of the shrimp in the Gulf of Mexico. That's scary to me. Um, and then there are other, it goes through other different types of um, elements that are found in our fish. And that's not something that we want to consume. It's not safe, right? So here's some really interesting pictures. I, got, I want you guys to take a minute, you know, pause the video, look over how dead zones occur, um, how dead zones are set up. Um, really kind of look through some of this. Here's the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Huge, massive damage you can see in that top right picture where the oil is just, it almost looks like a beach, right? It's just caked of oil. Um, you probably have seen with oil spills before um, where they've had to take the dawn and clean all the animals. Um, here's some um, different links for you guys to find some more information. You know, I always want you guys to look at things um, on your own. There's uh, the EPA website. Uh, you know, uh, you can find these in the slides that are in the Canvas module. Um, fixing the forest. Uh, make sure you guys know the International Model Forest Program started in 1992 in Canada, designed to implement sustainability in forest management. Um, they're real life laboratories. So take a moment, make sure you make a note of that. Um, here is our review slides and my 15 minutes of fame are up, guys. Thanks so much for being with me and I'll see you soon. Have a great day.